we've had questions coming through right the way uh, right the way through the day and uh, the first one came in it has uh, Andres I saw that you'd answered it in the chat but I think is it's a it's a useful interesting question that may apply to more than the person who answered uh, asked it in this case and this is um, a question saying I'm, I'm TOGAF certified which is one of our, our knowledge based certifications um, I'm I'm uh, TOGAF certified, a lot, as well as IT for IT and TOGAF Business Architecture, DP Bok, ITIL, and certified enterprise architect from Carnegie Mellon. And I'm, inter I'm interested in the OpenCA program. Um, and I've looked at the website. Do I apply directly to the Open Group as my employer doesn't have an ACP? Um, so maybe that's a good one for you, James. Uh, um, very simple answer yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, to apply the, to the apply. absolutely to the open, to the open group directly. Uh, there's if you fertile around on our website, you will find links to the open professions, and you'll find um, direct links to the application forms where we bought volume. Where we don't have those forms available, um, send them a message to the profession certification authority. Again, there's a link on that web page, and we'll sort you out. Great, thank you. Um, next question came in. I'm going to direct this one to Scott for obvious reasons. Um, uh, how does IBM manage awareness around technology standards during the onboarding process for architects? And is there any repository maintained around standards? If Scott, if you're there, I can't actually. Yeah, so, yes, uh, I'm, I'm here and, and uh, just in, I'd invite Paul Holman to chime in as well. Mm. Um, we, we do through normal education, the, the, the core fundamental courses that I talked about re being required for level one, we do point to references, which include um, websites, uh, hubs, and other uh, sources, including open group sources for those things, um, including TOGAF and other related methods. And uh, Paul, I don't know if you would have anything to add to that or not. I think the only thing I, I'd add, keeping it in the context of the profession uh, is, you know, part of the being a valid architect uh, or, you know, it, and keeping up to date and recertifying requires you to do so much ongoing education. Um, and we target our education around, obviously, you know, the latest uh, or, or the, the most relevant things that we need to deliver and the things we need to stay, uh, you know, abreast of. So, um, Ongoing education uh, is is a part of the requirement for recertification. Um, so that's the kind of virtuous feedback loop, I think, that fits. Great. OK, thank you, gentlemen. While you're there, Paul, I think this one is probably uh, as well. Yes, as well aimed at you as as anyone else. Um, but this may be one that others can chip in on as well. But um, I'm TOGAF certified, um, but I observe some challenges to make the industry identify with that. How, can you give me some guidance on how to promote our, myself and ourselves with uh, whether it be TOGAF certifications or, or, or other types of certification? Oh, OK. Um, so so the, the, the simple kind of answer, I, I think the, the problem we've ha always had is uh, a profession is um, it is actually that people look at uh, output and and so you know although when you're going and you you might need some kind of procedure you might need a house building or whatever and you're going to go and look and want to know somebody is certified that isn't the norm in the industry however if advocacy allows us to say you know, the reason that we've been able to do this well, the reason that job has been done well, et cetera, has been uh, reliant on the people that have got the, the competency and the certification, then that kind of builds up that sort of groundswell of, of reputation. Um, it, it's it's not easy um, and it's been a long, long problem, for, I think, for the IT profession, but my plea and it doesn't help in an in individual like tomorrow but my plea is that anybody who is certified should make sure that whenever they have any kind of uh, success or credit that they um, tie that back to that certification and how that has helped 
um, which is why the advocacy part is important to me because that creates the brand and the connection that basically it's important to do. Um, so yeah, it's got to be tied back to the results side um, in, in anything that you have, I think is the key part. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And, and I know increasingly we see um, uh, individuals um, promoting um, or at least sharing their their electronic credentials, their their badges um, in their social media profiles and on LinkedIn. It's uh, it's quite a common thing to see now, and that all that all helps to build not just the credibility um, uh, of the individual, but of course of of the profession and the program itself. So good. A any anyone else want to chip in with anything around uh, uh, how to uh, how to help sell the value of the cert of certifications? If if not, we can easily move on. Um, question here, uh, I think I'll direct this to you, Andrash. Um, but it, it's come up in 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 several of the um, several of the presentations this morning. And uh, can you say a little bit more about the portability of? the certifications under the Open Professions Programme. I've heard it mentioned, um, but does it literally mean I'm not tied to my current employer? Yeah, that's a, another really good question. So when we established uh, the Open Professions Programme, uh, we were thinking, you know, yes, just exactly that, that we wanted a industry standard to define the criteria that we wanted the certification, the professional certification to be portable. That is, once you got it, it was yours to keep. And the whole idea behind uh, a accredited program is that you're operating against the criteria, you're meeting the criteria that you would have to meet if you obtain certification direct through the direct route in uh, the open group, as James uh, just mentioned. So uh, you get to, you know, take your credential with you if you're certified. Um, and many companies um, are issuing, you know, their own badge, but also to the open group is issuing you a badge simultaneously. Um, other companies are just relying on the open group badge itself. So um that badge is still good when you leave that company and for as long as uh you're re-accrediting yourself uh recertifying yourself uh you absolutely have a portable credential great okay thank you yeah it's a it's a good advantage now we've had um i'm gonna i'm gonna dive in here we've had a few questions coming in about um uh we've been talking today about the open profession certification what does that mean for the TOGAF certification program and ju just to be clear that's not going away the to the, the knowledge based programs like TOGAF and and, and Archimate and open fair and IT for IT they're all they're all still there they are as i say knowledge based you take an exam and get certified so um they aren't uh, they aren't going away or being replaced with um with the milestone approach for this so you you can still do that but what what we do see is that people use those knowledge based certifications as stepping stones in themselves towards um the open profession type of certification so and on, on that point there's a there's a question that's uh, come in here which uh, i know the answer to but somebody else can answer for me um is it correct that you must have TOGAF 9.2 or 9.1 plus the TOGAF essentials um, to obtain the Open Professions certification. Peter's going to take that one. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Steve, I think it's very worth to mention that the Open Certified Architect program recognizes 37 what we call them legitimate architecture methods. Right. Yeah? And why are we doing that? Because architectural thinking, not shooting from the hip, following a decent process to come to a legitimate architecture. So TOGAF is, forgive me, the word is just one 
of the methods that we recognize as architecture practitioners can apply in the field. Uh, so why not? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, there, as, as you said, there are many different, uh, uh, many different frameworks and approaches recognized under the program. You, you don't have to uh, uh, get TOGAF first. So, um, question for Jeff, I guess a two, two part question. Um, uh, the first, the first part, I'm just combining two in there separate in here. The first part was, um, uh, is that, is CTPP actually live yet? Um, uh, but the, the other specific thing on what you said is, could you elaborate a little more, um, on your comments on how the program helped uh, de silo inside Seagate. Was that ACP or CCP? Uh, this sure. was CTPP. This, yes, oh. trusted technology. So, Jeff, if you're there. Yes, yeah. I yes, am here. There you are. Um, so to answer the 1st question, um, succinctly, yes, it is live. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the planning phases uh, for a 3rd level of certification beyond the master. Uh, the current level 2, uh, but that has yet to be kind of rolled out. Um, but yes, this is an, an open cert that you can go for. Um, the 2nd part of the question, how did this certification help us to de silo? Um, that is, I could talk for, <laughs> for a long time on that 1, but I'll just say that. Um, you know, Seagate is a company that's been around for a long time. Um, we have numerous, uh, families of products that we offer that have very different. Um, physical and digital profiles in terms of development, supply chain, manufacturing, et cetera. And uh, this certification, along with the adoption of the OTTPS, allowed us to take these different product families that have different development cycles, uh, development teams, development uh, policies, processes, procedures, et cetera, and really apply one kind of standard uh, for best practices across all of those. Um, so in other words, you know, we build a certain type of drive in a certain country um, versus a not completely, but mostly different uh, type of architecture in another part of the world. And we're able to invite the experts from both of those development teams uh, together and ask them to abide by the same set of best practices for both. Um, this is a, it's a very universal standard and um, as an extension of that, the the type of people that we want to go out and perform this implementation, um, we can more readily and easily identify those skill sets uh, by using this uh, certification as a yardstick to do so. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. Again, you all have some could all have something to say on it. Um, uh, but um, maybe I'll start with you, Andrush. Um, my question it says the person says my question would be which path is recommended for those of us with skill, knowledge, knowledge and experience in technical areas, but we feel like we haven't truly got the depth required to certify in a technical domain with experience at senior level to provide overall direction for the delivery of programs um, programs of work. For the business through ICT transformation. So I guess my interpretation of this is kind of a, a broad, a broad level of experience and some high level experience, but you know, in the in the T shape, the broad one, but not necessarily the uh, the, the depth. But uh, any so guidance that, for how to approach that or how how our program could help that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, again a, a fair question. Um, I think it has to come from two different perspectives: the specialist perspective and the architect perspective. So, if they're really interested in becoming an architect, um, then they should probably take a look at level one criteria um, and um, and begin to kind of take uh, inventory of their skills and experiences. Remember. This is an experiential certification, so it, it's the application of your skills through ex successful experience. So looking at what is required at level 1 would be 
a, a fantastic start for whatever domain that you think that you might be able to, um, you know, recognize as uh, your role in your organization or consultancy. Um, if it's a specialty, obviously, <laughs> you know what specialty that you're uh, part of, or at least best identify as. And um, again, start with level one, uh, take inventory of your uh, of both your skills and the experiences, the successful experiences that you've had. So what projects have you been on? Um, how does that stack up uh, against the requirements for level one? You may find actually that you're not level one. You, you could uh, stretch a little and go for level two, or you could get certified in level one and begin to collect the milestone badges for level two. So that's, that's probably the best way to start is to take that inventory and use the criteria as a checklist for, you know, guiding your career forward. Yeah, and that is certainly part of the, I mean, not just for the individuals, but for organizations, that's been part of the value we've we've heard is, you know, this, this provides a consistent um, kind of consistent uh, breadcrumbs on the trail for people to, uh, to think of when they're evolving their career. So, um, good, good. Um, Question for Maureen. Um, uh, it's, you know, the, the data science profession is uh, is very very new, um, and it's a hot area. Um, how does one start getting involved, um, or start down? Sorry, start down the path um, to being a data scientist. Um, when I have a keen interest, but I don't know how to start. Ah, great question. We we work with a lot of people in that situation. <laughs> Um, we actually have a, a competency model, which we can share. Uh, IBM published it as a white paper, and it really takes a look at all of the different skills that are required for a data scientist, goes into a fair amount of detail, and allows you to kind of do a self-assessment and where you have may have gaps. So sometimes people are switching into a data science path and starting with kind of assessing your own skills and then identifying those gaps is, is one step. And there's a lot of uh, great education available for uh, you know, taking courses to fill those gaps. And then I would encourage them to take a look at the Open Group Data Scientist Certification for Level 1 and see there's clearly an outline there of, of what's going to be expected to become certified. So it's a great a roadmap that you can build between assessing your current skills and then how to get to the point where you'd be able to uh, certify. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question is more about uh, applicable to uh, to the program as a whole. Um, various people have mentioned the the, the process today, and um, uh, the question is, what level of detail do we need to share as part of um, the EA project project expectations, as we cannot share more details due to certain confidentialities. So, it's a common question: How do we know that we're not uh, giving away too much of our company's uh, intellectual property or or details of client information? Um, what's the level that we need to do in order to get certified in the in the program? Um, maybe that's a good one for you, James. I'll start. That sounds a, a, a good challenge. Um, the, the, the answers to questions are not required to for you. You're not required to give a detailed definite description of the content of a project. Um, the questions are quite specific, so they'll ask you about, you know, what was you know, explain something of the context and the requirements you're trying to meet and and and, and how did you demonstrate this this particular skill? So um, project information is asked for, but not in the sense of asking for the nature and content of the project, but to use aspects of the experience you, you, uh, you gained on the project that demonstrated a skill. Um, so uh, you know, that, that's probably as close as I can get. You'd need to sort of look carefully at the questions and take a view about how much you are prepared to reveal in, in demonstrating how you meet the criterion. So, uh, as I said, I'll repeat, um, we don't want to have a detailed project description, but we do want to have information that demonstrates how you uh, met, how you meet the particular skill requirement. 
As James, I'll add on there that, you know, all of our board members from the direct certification route are under NDA and they're actually uh, take a stipend to uh, kind of tie them to the, the work that they're doing. Um, and uh, we can always, I mean, you know, we've done this before. Uh, we can always put together a board of individuals uh, that are from the community that you're um, from maybe uh, you're a government entity and you need government folks to be part of that. Uh, maybe you're in the telecom industry. Maybe you need uh, your own company to be part of the direct certification route. Uh, James, we've done this before, right? And if there are some sensitive sensitivities here, then uh, we I think we can address those. Yes, indeed. So, so first Thank step, you, have a look. First step is have a look and see what the, you know, wh whether the problem is real or rather just something uh, that, that uh, you might rightfully be worried about, but, but validate it and then kind of contact us and see how we can adjust it, uh, anything or accommodate you if there is a real problem. Excellent. So I've got a, I'm going to try and uh, combine two questions here, but maybe, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe it's not. The first part of the question is is probably for let's see for Peter and Scott primarily, um, and it's about it's about how do you sell to your organisation the value of being an ACP? What 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 is it that that brings? And the second part of the question um, is actually for um, for those who are let's see for smaller not international organisations. How would you recommend adopting uh, the open profession certification, uh, knowing that there are fewer people dedicated to enterprise architecture, for example? Um, and you know, how do you sell the value to organizations without international reach? So I guess it's a sort of big company, small company thing, but there is probably some commonality among among those. So I would think um, maybe Peter, do you have anything to say about that or? I think you're on mute, Peter. There you go. Okay, so let me start then. Um, so for small companies, um, we have a complete framework ready just to roll out in your organization. Not a lot of resources uh, needed. You can just actually jump start and go ahead with the program. As you've seen uh, from the presentation from, from Scott, uh, you need quite a lot of things in a larger organization to get an established profession and likewise a capability, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for a small organization, it's, it's kind of plug and play. Uh, for a larger organization, uh, the benefit is there. Uh, there's a financial benefit that's very tangible, but also, and that actually applies to both, um, that getting known to the market of running an established profession according to industries open industry standards yeah, about a variety of professions we have four now makes a statement in the market if you ask me yeah. i have seen requests for proposals from governments please mention how many open certified yada 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 you have right. yeah. So that just a couple of top of mind value statements I have. Good to hear. Good to hear. And that that that's part of the value of the promotion and the and the uh, the giving back and uh, you know talking about it and sharing sharing on social media. It's all uh, it all aside, helps. Aside from the cultural aspects of hey, if you are an employer driving your profession in a professional manner, that's always good. Absolutely. Anyone else has anything to add on that topic? Yeah, Steve, this is Scott. I'll just add that um, there were two main benefits that, that I've noticed. One is that you have the ability as an ACP to, to customize and make sure some of your uh, extremely relevant information and uh, capabilities included. Um, but the other thing is, I think what, what Peter was referencing, which is other things happen when you make the commitment to be an ACP, which is you know, you get the you get the team, you get the socialization, you get the teaming and collaboration. You start to build a culture, and I think that that's uh, one of the byproducts that's positive. Great, yeah. thanks, Scott. 
Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, if I get certified as an open CA level one solution architect, can I then recertify as an enterprise architect? And if yes, should I apply again at level one or can I go directly to level two as an enterprise architect? Is that one for you, Paul or James? I'll, I'll, I'll take it because that's a yeah. sort, that's a sort yeah. of a, a process thing. And the answer to both parts is yes, um, to be simple. Um, you can change your discipline. So you certify at level one, a solution architect, you've done two experience profile milestone badges for 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 you know for solution architecture. Um, when you come up to recertification, you can submit an experience profile milestone in enterprise architecture and change your discipline to enterprise architecture. Or you can apply for level two in enterprise architecture. So it, the choice is yours, but the pathways are all open. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question uh, that came in through the chat. Um, uh, and and I know the answer is going to be it depends, folks. So we need an additional answer to it depends. Um, what what is the average time needed between um, acquiring a new badge and uh, a level change? I think I think what the question is intended to say is you know how how off, how long does it take to move from one level to another? I'll take a shot at that and then, you know, I'd love to hear Paul Homan talk on this too, because I think Paul, you're, you're, you know, one of those individuals who has a lot of credibility here on this. But, um, so, uh, if you're, if you're already been in the, in the industry for, you know, 10 to 15 years, you're probably, you know, um, more than, uh, just starting out in your career. Um, hopefully you've got enough experience to get level one or level two. Uh, and in that case, there's no, you know, required, you know, pause to go between level one and level two necessarily. Um, I, I think the, the, the real question is if you're starting off, you know, uh, you know, just brand new into the industry using the criteria as a guidepost, um, it usually takes about you know, three years to get level one certified, uh, another, you know, two to five to get uh, level two certified. And level three really is all about, you know, kind of being able to advance the state of the art of the profession itself. So that's kind of a, a, a 10 year like milestone. You've been around for 10 years and you're making, you know, significant contributions to your company as well as um, having an external influence. So more of a, a little bit of an executive feel at level three. Um, so those are kind of, uh, you know, not solid, solid uh, guideposts, but, but fairly decent. What do you, what are your thoughts there, Paul? <laughs> so I want to say it depends. So it's so badly. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to. Oh, damn, I just did. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 so there's a couple of different perspectives and if I'm going to change. So um, f for me, it, people are always keen to kind of progress. And, you know, actually, there's a certain number of things you need to collect to be able to reach that kind of next level, if you like. Just a, a slightly different perspective on it. Each of those steps is an investment in your career journey. And I, I genuinely believe that there is a, a an argument to make sure that you have gotten the most out of each of those steps so that you don't overly try and minimize it. If you rush through to level three as quick as you possibly could, you know, just by kind of getting all of the right ingredients in place quickly. Yes, great. You, you will achieve a certain level. But I think, you know, to be fair to yourself, um, there is huge value in, in gained in doing it. It's a bit like the difference between um, you know, watching a film on one and a half times speed, you've reached the end of the film and you know the plot and you know what happened, but did you actually get the most out of it and everything along the way? So, you know, I think there's a gentle balance. The other side is, I think time is one thing and we've talked about process and requirements. I, one of the big things I just wanted to kind of come in and, it, and it's kind of related to this, but kind of related to some of the other questions as well is, um, you should be using a coach, you should be using a mentor as a coach to help you work out uh, 
and you know how much content you've got whether you're ready for the next stage and how valuable it is that you develop that area and how long you want to spend doing it and that coaching is something that the process allows you to go and tap on someone's shoulder and say will you coach me to the next level and have a discussion with them and if they say you know you should be doing that in months or years have the conversation with another adult and try to get to a sense where you believe you've got something that's realistic that you can invest the right amount of time get the most out of it um, and, and see yourself develop and grow along along that path so uh, slightly different and but hopefully that kind of helps set my perspective on it anyway thanks paul um james you've probably got something to say on this yeah i did just want to add one thing um apart from paul i thought that was a a, a great response um very credible advice to pe people in their careers but i think um it's just important to understand um if you're coming into the program for the first time you can do your benchmarking do your self-assessment you can either apply for level one or level two you can you know they're not a, that's you you don't have to do level one before level two for level three, you need to have been certified at level two sometime in the past. Um, so th th that's the kind of procedural thing. But if you're coming at it the first time, judge who you are against the criteria, make your plan um, and apply for the level that applies to you. OK, thank you. Um, question for Maureen. Um, for architects, I understand many of them have backgrounds in IT. Um, what is the typical background for data scientists? Great question. Um, the backgrounds really do vary quite a bit for data scientists. Um, in the past five to six years, we've seen more and more universities put programs in place. So for data science and AI degrees, um, and so those cohorts are graduating now, and, and that's a very typical background. But we have people who have such varied backgrounds. As long as they have the, the quantitative skills, you know, we've got um, physics majors and a lot of economics majors and that that kind of thing. But but then we have just some wild cards that came from backgrounds you would never guess <laughs> into the field. So the common element really is, you know, the quantitative skills that um, intense curiosity, you know, and problem solving approach and really wanting to do that. So we see a lot of people that have those kind of background skills um, and all the key elements, and then they're able to transition into the, the role of a data scientist by just filling a few gaps um, in terms of right. their skills. Right, thank you. So we we need. I'm going to I'm end on this one. Uh, um, uh, nice little uh, challenging question at the end that that uh, it doesn't apply to to any or not obviously applicable to any individual, but it's about the programs themselves. Are the entire set of open certification programs under discussion reliable, and can they be trusted without having at least a solid university education in the related field? So to me, is it, you know, is is having a is having a computer science degree important for a technical specialist, for example, or you know, is it a prerequisite, um, or should it be? So I actually touched on this in my presentation to a certain extent. You know, um, I uh, I think a university degree, while not essential, provides you with some intangible experience that uh, learning in other ways doesn't. Um, that is how to get along with people and how to team and uh, gives people a little time to grow up. Um, but in reality, I've had you know many friends who were fellows in in you know uh, IBM and in Verizon who never went uh, either to college or just finished an undergraduate degree and. Um, you know, they they learned much of what they learned, um, you know, on the job. And uh, to me, those were folks who are at least as every bit as good as uh, those. Um, sorry, Scott, who have a PhD. <laughs> um, and um, 
And and so do do does a PhD give you some you know experience? Uh, absolutely. Does a master's degree give you an experience? Yes, absolutely. Um, does that mean that you can't um, get those base foundation skills elsewhere? Absolutely. So really, this program is not about the where you get the base foundation, where you get this foundation of skills from. It's measuring your ability. Um, to actually apply what you have through experience and meeting their criteria. So you will have to have a similar set of skills in order to, you know, uh, obtain the, the experience requirements, those conformance criteria requirements. How you got them, uh, the standard is silent on that. Thank you. Any, anyone else got anything to... Uh... To add to that, I think it plays to the whole the whole topic of the the extent to which uh, you know a a formal academic education is is required, and uh, quite often we see uh, we we see individuals now saying, you know, I, I really for whatever reason don't don't uh, want to go down that path. Are there are there others I can uh, I can take instead? You know, apprenticeships or whatever. I, Looks I'm, like you want to say something, Paul. Uh, well, I was just going to say, especially working in industrial, uh, a lot of uh, over the years, a lot of uh, people I know have come through an apprenticeship route, have come come through uh, very hands on type uh, work, either through, you know, uh, well, drawing used to be hands on once upon a time before it was automated. But, uh, you know, even, even the kind of manufacturing and assembly type areas. Um, and interestingly, I, I can think of several conversations and I won't name them at all because, you know, but with people who have said to me, I'm not technical, I'm not an architect. And then I've said, but just tell me what you do. And they have described the almost perfect project profiles that you go, you know, you think like an architect, you, 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 you to me sound like an architect. And, and all you need is the coaching to be able to uh, demonstrate and evidence to somebody else why what you've done is, is, is worthy of, of the experience of an architect. So, you know the, the the certification to me is validation of what you have done, not what you have learned on its own. So, right, yeah, so right. It's good point. Good point. I think that's and, really part of the power of the certification as well. You know, we have a data scientist um, apprenticeship. You know, in the U.S. and many companies are taking advantage of it, and so we've kind of proven that very point. You know, people can. Get the skills in any number of ways and i think particularly with this past year of the pandemic you know when people were looking at alternative ways to increase their skills we may be seeing even more of that uh coming yeah, yeah. and i and i think you know for i i've personally been along over the years most involved on the enterprise architecture side and although we're now starting to see some um certainly undergraduate courses in enterprise architecture just didn't exist for for a long long time you know we started seeing some some modules some addition you know some optional things and some master's programs but you know if you're talking about at least having an undergrad in the domain then uh, some of those don't exist yet um, or at least not many not much choice so any final comments from the panel on that or anything else if not, then thank you each and every one of you for your uh, for your presentations and for uh, sharing your uh, your experience and and uh, expertise on the topic. Um, so a, a warm uh, virtual round of applause for all our panelists today. Thank you. And uh, that's it, folks, for today. Um, we will uh, leave the. Uh, leave the meeting open for a short while if you want to continue in the chat channel to uh, to share anything or, or give any feedback. Um, always welcome. There are other ways to do that too. But um, hopefully many of you will be able to join us tomorrow. We have a TOGAF user group tomorrow where we're specifically going to look at topics such as uh, TOGAF in agile and digital environments and uh, how it how it plays there as well as TOGA from reference architectures. So uh, hopefully many of you will join us for that tomorrow. And uh, meantime, um, take care everyone and thank you for your, for your time. Thanks everyone for the questions and your contributions. And as I say, we'll leave the chat open 
um, for a few minutes uh, to uh, see how uh, it, see if any of you want to share anything and, and I can see some things coming in now so I'll leave it there be well everyone and uh, see you again soon I hope Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We're just going to run the open group video now uh, for the next five minutes while you can still put information into the chat channel if you want to give us your feedback, be appreciated. So thank you all and we'll hopefully uh, have some of you here tomorrow. Thanks.